I'm so glad that you said that because uh, before we clicked record, we were both like, what are we going to talk about? <laughs> how are we going to start? That's what we say every this? week. Don't tell them that. It's true. It's true. Just when you thought April was over, there's one more Sunday. Sunday, April 30th. We have Sunday coming. We are in the book of Acts. For those of you following the narrative lectionary, Acts 13 and then a little bit of 14. 14 is really where the story picks up. So, Reverend Thorne, you are back in the pulpit for this one. Yeah. Uh, how are you approaching this narrative lectionary text this Sunday? What's going on in the story? What's going on in the world that's coming into the story? Just give us a glimpse so we can either borrow your best ideas or be primed for what you're going to preach on Sunday. So I, I feel like this Sunday, maybe more, even more so than the ones that have come before, we're really feeling the crush of what's happening in our world. We've had multiple mass shootings, uh, shootings of people turning around in driveways and children knocking on doors, asking for directions. Um, and really this sort of clash between backgrounds and strangers and this text is Paul's first sermon to the Gentile world. And so it's it's interesting, given what's going on in our world at the moment, um, that we also have a text where this message that was initially thought to be or maybe meant to be for the Jews is now being shared with the Gentiles. So just this notion of contrast and border crossing and who's our neighbor, who the message is meant for, um, it, it's an interesting um, mashup, I, I think, um, in, in our society with the text. You mean the concept of there being tension around having to go beyond the people who just look and feel and talk like me? That's not a new phenomenon. That's that's kind of <laughs> been the waters we've been swimming in. And... Right. No, it's pretty ancient. And <laughs> of course, you know, Paul and Barnabas are doing a thing um, that is intended to be healing, um, that is intended to stretch uh, their notion and, and the people's notion about who this good news is for. And that is often a, a challenging thing. Um, yeah. uh, some commentators say that they're putting their lives at risk doing this. There are people who think they shouldn't be doing the thing. And for us at Riverside, talking about risk taking, uh, this is also the Sunday when we are acknowledging uh, the Black Manifesto, which James Foreman delivered in our, our historic sanctuary 54 years ago. Um, so he certainly got up and did a challenging, uh, risky thing in a space where um, his life was in danger, um, literally and uh, metaphorically. And for those who, who aren't uh, tracking that historical moment, because it's not just Riverside history, that is definitely right. American history that we should all right. acknowledge. Mm -hmm. Although I'll be honest, I, I didn't know of its depth until I came to Riverside, so I'm glad to have learned it. But that was May 4th is the technical anniversary, 1969. James Foreman, uh, he, he joined the procession, essentially, uh, on Sunday morning. And as the choir and the clergy all went up to the chancel, he just kept on walking up too, and then stood at the steps uh, the same steps where Martin Luther King offered his uh, Beyond Vietnam speech, um, and he stood and, and offered a different speech, the Black Manifesto. Uh, uh, Foreman had been the executive secretary of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee and was one of the key leaders in the 1964 Freedom Summer. Uh, so he was very much involved in all of this work. Uh, and essentially, the Black Manifesto was demanding that white churches and synagogues pay $500 million in reparations. Yeah. I don't think we've done that just yet are we is that in the budget for next year where are we at <laughs> we're we're not even close um and of course riverside wasn't called to contribute the whole 500 million no. um but with a lot of fits and starts and and uncertainty about what this word reparation meant riverside did pledge to raise um half a million five hundred thousand and i believe at the end of the period that they set for themselves they had gotten close to four hundred thousand and of course out of that comes a fund that we still continue to uh, draw on today and make available to organizations who are doing the work it is it is our way of paying reparations and it's called the sharing fund if you're not familiar with it i would encourage you to go to the church's website. Um, it's a pretty easy bar to apply. Um, and you'll see all the all of the criteria there for um, benefiting from uh, this fund that Riverside set up um, almost 55 years ago. You know, I think it's a really fitting 
parallel. I mean, obviously it works well at Riverside because Foreman literally stepped into our space for that mm -hmm. moment. But I think any church could acknowledge that that history that happened 54 years ago that continues to happen today because, I mean, Foreman wasn't in the moment met with open arms. Uh, the Not organists tried to drown him out and people walked Correct. out. Right. It, it was right. not this like, hooray, we celebrate you. Repar it was, it was, I mean, it's probably what Paul was feeling and faced in some places where it's like, it wasn't always, it was what's needed, but it wasn't right. always what was welcomed in that instance. Right. Well, one of the things I love about um, Riverside and the, um, the archives that we have is that our archivist says that we don't hide our history, whether it's good or bad, we save it and we, um, and we share it. So um, just before April 30th, there will be an exhibit that goes up that's got the New York Times front page cover that came out talking about this. And as, as you're suggesting, Jim, um, the, the church was not uh, portrayed in a very um, positive light uh, because the church did not um, conduct itself in a very positive light. As you said, the organist played very loudly and, and drowned uh, Mr. Foreman's remarks out. What I, what I love about this and where I think there's a connection for us um, who are trying to do this work of love and justice, um, James Foreman was prophetic in that moment, you know, put his body and his um, reputation and self on the line. And I think there is a similar challenge with Paul and Barnabas in this space, bringing the good news to people who may or may not want to hear it. And the challenge that's involved in that, the risk that's involved in that, and the invitation I think that comes to us to do a similar, to do a similar work in our own lives is where I think this, um, this very ancient text aligns itself with a little bit older text. And then of course, with mm. our current lives, um, we are vessels. James Foreman was a vessel uh, through which the Christ um, shows mm. up and in his own way, I think he was prophesying and yeah. um, inviting churches and synagogues to actually live the faith that we profess and proclaim um, yep. such that we can say at the end of our time, to God be the glory. Um, we have we have done the work. And, and I think it's showing up and continuing to show up. Right. Uh, what I, One thing I love most about this history of Black Manifesto at Riverside is the following Sunday, James Foreman came to worship and sat in the front row. And I believe he stood silently during the sermon. He, uh, he wasn't removed. He was there. But it's just that sense of he, it wasn't just a one one and done. It wasn't a one hit wonder. I'm, I'm still here. Uh, this is still important, still necessary. I just what was he feeling on that Sunday a week later? Like, oh, that right. just the well, energy, the tension, the emotion. There had to be everything in the room and in his own being. All of that. All of that. And I, I hadn't thought about it until you brought it up that he stood for the length of the sermon. I'm not sure how long they were preaching back in those days. But there's something beautifully embodied about that, the standing and the silence. And it doesn't sound necessarily... Um, as if he were protesting, but certainly he was doing something with his body. And, um, yeah. you know, we are playing with, um, working together as a community, I think, to figure out, so what about these bodies, what they can do, what they are holding, uh, what they need to release and let go of. You know, we are people who've been through a lot of things with lockdown, um, with the, um, previous and current administration, just with all the things going on in our world. I just took a deep breath because I needed to try to let some of that go. Um, but these stories about people in their cars um, being shot, uh, people um, accidentally going to a wrong car and being shot, um, we are holding all of that in our bodies, whether we know it or not. And I think what Foreman was communicating in the Black Manifesto, what Paul and Barnabas are trying to share with Gentile bodies in the ancient world, um, I think we have to ask ourselves, so what about that? You know, how does that land with us? How do we hold mm -hmm. that? How do we carry that, uh, particularly the good news of that, forward into our, our lives? You know, I, I love this approach to a sermon just because I think it, it both in what it's specifically doing and in what it models for others to do, uh, where, you know, you're, you're preaching this book from thousands of years ago. That's where this story begins that we're entering into. And then you're obviously intersecting it in the world around us today. Like that's a text that we bring, but then you're also looking at the particular context of the pulpit you're preaching in. 
and and that the thing that happened in that specific space. So, you know, we all need to be looking at the contextual nature of preaching and we can borrow best ideas and lean on each other, but there's always a unique fingerprint that comes out of a sermon and it's just interweaving all of those pieces together that I just had to point out the homiletical, you know, masterclass we're getting a glimpse of right now. <laughs> I'm, I'm so glad that you said that because uh, before we clicked record, we were both like, what are we going to talk about? <laughs> how are we going to start? That's what we say every this? week. Don't tell them that. <laughs> it's true. It's true. It's true. But I think it's also to your point about masterclass, um, but also the way that we do worship and the way that we are in Christian community together. It's always so much better in community. Um, yeah. I always come away from these conversations with um, clarity and ideas and, you know, juiciness that I never would have come up with alone. I think that's the case for us when we are in worship together, watching other bodies, experiencing other bodies. But it's Mm -hmm. also the gift of being in Christian community. Um, There's healing there. There are things that we carry for one another when we um, can't carry hope or um, joy for ourselves. So, Yeah. yeah. It really is the the way of Christ. It really is how we're following the leader. Yeah, that's yeah. that's that's the that's what we all signed up for, whether we knew it or not. Yeah. That's right. That's right. Now, now I can't let us end before I point out my one very Bible geeky <laughs> detail about yes. this. So we um, love Bible this, geeks. This, this this is for you people leading a Bible study or just playing Bible trivia pursuit. Uh, Acts 13 is where this section begins, where we're introduced to Saul and Barnabas, because he's still going by Saul at that point. And then in Acts chapter 14, when they go to this Gentile space, suddenly he's Paul and Barnabas, Uh, which, by the way, just goes to show that it wasn't one of these like Abram to Abraham kind of name changes. This is literally just the same person using a name to reflect the context he's in. Saul is a Hebrew name. Paul is a Greek name. So when he's in a Greek speaking context, he goes by his Greek name. When he's in a Hebrew speaking context, he goes by his Hebrew name. It's like if I went by Santiago in Mexico or something, which I don't know enough Spanish to probably actually do that. But it, that's all it is. It's the same name. It's not like Except a change. Your it's, name is James. So you would probably be Jaime in Santiago. <laughs> I mean, you have see, this just Jaime. shows you how little it is. <laughs> There you go. There you go. There you go. And I think there's something in that for us as well, just in terms of context and how we show up uh, to, mm. to share this good news. We do need to translate, right? Ourselves, yeah. our bodies, our message and our story. Um, yep. And I think sometimes we we get stuck and we get frozen. Yeah. And I think this is what Foreman did when he came into the church. Certainly a church like Riverside that has a history of caring about love and justice. He was certainly speaking a language that I think it took the folk a minute to catch up with, but they caught up Mm. with it. And they had to change their language, I think, after having that encounter with this other body. Well, look at that. It's like my little tangent just got brought back onto the main road again. That was a lovely little detour. (laughs) (laughs) Absolutely. Well, here we are, end of April. It's coming. We'd love to hear from those of you who are preachers, Bible study leaders, Sunday school teachers, whatever your context is. How are you going to engage this story in your space? Uh, will the Black Manifesto come up? It's a great history. I'll put a link in the description of this so you can learn more about the history of that moment. Uh, and like you said, Adrian, that you know we don't want to shy away from our history, even the parts that aren't always putting us in the best light. Those are sometimes the things we can learn the most from and have to keep in front of us so we don't repeat the same mistakes. And the Bible is really good at that, right? There's so many stories in the Bible that you're like, if I were writing the Bible, I maybe wouldn't have put that one in there. But, you know, the good and the bad are in there. Uh, The, the, you know, the attractive and the less and the less so. Yeah. That's kind of what it means to be human. You got it all. Amen. Amen. All right. Comments, questions, ideas. What are you doing? Share so we can all learn from each other. What are you thinking, scheming? And uh, join us for worship on Sunday if you are in the New York area, or even if you're not, we're online, trcnyc.org. If you have another church, that's cool too. We are not going to try to poach you, but we love the space to cross paths as much as we are able for this work of love and justice. See you next time.